Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Johnny, and I'm an alcoholic. I'm glad to be here tonight. I'm glad to be sober. I'm glad to be in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I want to, uh, I want to thank Dave or the committee or whoever is responsible for extending the privilege of me participating in an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. It's my opinion, I hope it always remains such, that it's some type of a privilege to be allowed to come and sit in these rooms. I hope I don't ever get it through my sick head that I have a right to everything that goes on in Alcoholics Anonymous, just because I was lucky enough to stumble into a room and get sober and stay that way. The reason I can tell you that is because everything that's good and decent in my life today is the byproduct of... I didn't know. I've had people come down the aisles at me before. But... <laughs> Never with a basket full of money. That's (laughs) everything that's good and decent in my life. Was that what I was going to say? Maybe I ought to start all over again. It is a byproduct of the God I discovered sitting in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I have uh, no reason or uh, no rhyme or no particular idea why I've been given the gift of sobriety. It's not because I'm deserving of it. It's not because I'm anything special in God's eyes. It's just because I happen to be in a place in November of 1959 that the message of Alcoholics Anonymous was carried to me. And I was in an absolute perfect state that day to become a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was in a state of absolute and total hopelessness. I hear a lot of people talk about being desperate in Alcoholics Anonymous, and they want to know, hope you're desperate. I don't know how in God's world you could be desperate for something if you don't know what you're missing. And when I sit in that meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, I was just hopeless. Because every day that I was going to live for the rest of my life was going to be just like the day that I was living. I had long since given up every idea, every hope of it ever being any different than what it was. It had been that way for a long, long time. And no matter what I did, I didn't make promises anymore. I didn't make deals with God anymore. I didn't make any type of deals anymore because I knew I could not keep those promises. Because I was doomed to live the way I was living until somebody shot me out there on the streets or I took an overdose or something and died out there. I just I just didn't have any way. Now, I don't even know why that come about. And the funny thing about it, it was the fourth day of November, 1959. There's a lot of new people here tonight. A lot of you stood up and a lot of you didn't. But that night, I, day I was sitting in that meeting, I was staring at an answer that I had sold my soul for. Obviously, I couldn't recognize the answer because I didn't know what my problem was. But I've never known what my problem was. I was born needing some type of an answer. I'm restless and I'm irritable and I'm discontented. But I don't understand then, as I've come to understand today, that those are the symptoms probably the most deadly illness has ever been known to mankind. My illness kills more people than anything in the 5,000 years of recorded history that it's ever had. The American Medical Association says it's the number one killer in the world today. It also says it's the second leading cause of permanent insanity today. Now, I didn't know that because I never knew what was wrong with me. I knew a lot about whiskey. (laughs) Everybody in my family drank whiskey, except my grandma. I mean, they made it, and they sold it, and they drank it. And they gathered up on Saturday night and beat the hell out of one another. That's what they did. (laughs) I mean, they were Irish. They had no religion to hold their guilt down, so they just went crazy, them people. (laughs) 
I mean, I had uncles who lived in penitentiaries. I had aunts who worked in houses on the other side of the track. My mother got drunk and beat up my dad. My dad got drunk and beat up my mother, and every once in a while they both got drunk and beat me up. I took a look at that. And my idea about that was, I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to be like these people. I'm going to step out of that world. I'm going to have something. I'm going to do something. I'm going to be something. So I started looking away around for a way out of this dilemma that I was in. I've, I've been I've been on a search all my life for what I found alcoholics not. And no matter how temporarily it seemed to have the fix before I got here, I always knew that it really wasn't the answer, that there was something more or something more in my life that I was missing, but it satisfied me for a while. I looked up one day, I saw my grandmother. My grandmother lived till she was 90 years old and never took a drink of alcohol or smoked a cigarette in her life. My grandmother wouldn't think it's a big deal that I've been sober almost 48 years. Big deal, she'd say. I ain't had a drink for 90. <laughs> I used to look at her and say, you ought to have a couple grand and make you feel better from time to time. <laughs> My grandmother got everything she needed out of life out of church, the church that she went to. I mean, I watched her when I was a little boy, and I spent a lot of time with my grandmother because my parents were busy. I watched her get up on Sunday morning after my uncles and my aunt had used her house for a war zone. Stepping over the bodies and putting on the best thing she had, she took off and was gone for a couple hours, and when she came back, something had happened to her. I could see it just as clear as I could see you. She was a little lighter in her step and a little easier in her being, and she kind of danced around these people and cleaned them up and sang songs to Jesus. And I took a look at that, and I filed that in my keen alcoholic mind. For you who are new in Alcoholics Anonymous, this is the only place in the world you're ever going to hear about the keen alcoholic mind. <laughs> you're never going to go to Al-Anon and hear about the keen alcoholic mind. But see, I was all screwed up because I don't know what's wrong with me. I got the idea that all I'm going to have to do is go where my grandmother goes and do what my grandmother does. I'd be like my grandmother. I am not like my grandmother. My grandmother's not alcoholic. I didn't know that. So as a child, I put my hand in my grandmother's hand, and I went over and sit in my grandmother's church and waited for whatever happened to Granny to happen to me. And I don't remember anything good or bad happening to me one way or the other. But I do know there was nothing wrong with my grandmother's church. There was just something wrong with the jackass sitting in it, me. See, what I was doing in that church is what I've done all my life prior to coming to Alcoholics Anonymous. A long time after I was here, probably even a great deal of time today, I'm looking for something way out here to make me feel better in here, which only goes to prove to me that the problem's always been there. One day, I sit on the back porch with my grandfather. I'm watching my grandfather drink whiskey out of a fruit jar. My grandfather put it down, got up and went somewhere, and I picked it up and took a drink. That's all I did. The next couple of minutes of my life is what makes me an alcoholic anyhow. I'm not an alcoholic because I spent the next 20 years of my life creating mayhem out in the world. I'm an alcoholic because I have some type of an abnormal reaction to alcohol. And what I am near died learning is that everybody who drinks it does not get the same reaction from it that I do. I didn't understand that. Now, I sit around meetings of alcoholics, and I'm, as I hear people get up here and talk about drinking, they say it gagged them. They didn't like the taste of it made them throw up. They just talk bad about whiskey. (laughs) I want to go up and slap them, for Christ's sake. That's like bad-mouthing an old girlfriend or something, you know what I mean? (laughs) Alcohol's the best friend I ever had, for Christ's sake. Alcohol kept me alive long enough to get to Alcoholics Anonymous. That's the only purpose alcohol ever served in my life. If I hadn't taken a drink of alcohol on my grandfather's back porch that day, I'd have blown my brains out shortly thereafter. That's I know that. But you see, the physical reaction I got from alcohol 
is not the thing that took me to the gates of insanity and death and beyond. You see what happens to alcoholics of my type? That when I take a drink of alcohol, something happens inside of my system that doesn't happen to heavy drinkers. It doesn't happen to drug addicts. It doesn't happen to gamblers. It doesn't happen to overeaters. When I put a drink of alcohol into my system, then and only then am I drinking to overcome a craving that's beyond all human understanding and beyond all human help. I didn't know that. Because I took a drink, and then the drink took a drink, and then the drink took me. Because three days later, I was pulled out from underneath a bridge, stood in front of a judge, and sentenced to the Hutchison State Reform School. Twenty years later, I took a drink of alcohol. They pulled me out of a car and compted to sit in front of a judge and sentenced me to 20 years in the penitentiary. Now, that's what happened to me when I drank. I got drunk and went places. <laughs> I <laughs> traveled around out there. I went from reform school to reform school to junior penitentiaries to penitentiaries to nut houses. Now they call them treatment centers. <laughs> I'm a little more partial to Nuthouse, if you want to know the truth. I mean, it's a little more macho. Oh, come on, for Christ's sake. If you're going to be bad, be bad. Don't quit drinking because you puke a little. Hang in there. <laughs> Give it everything you got. Alcoholics Anonymous works a hell of a lot better when you run out of options and court cards. I gave it everything I had out there. I threw everything into the battle and lost the battle, and I didn't know what was kicking my fanny. I walked out of institution from the time I was 10 years old until I was 30 years old, as physically sober as I am this moment. Not one time did I ever say to myself, Self, do you realize how long it's been since you've had a series of electroshock treatments? Why don't you have a drink? Why don't you just have a drink of alcohol and go out there and kill your baby brother? Why don't you have a drink of alcohol and go out there and tear your mother's heart out one more time? Why don't you have a drink of alcohol and go out and stand on them street corner and join them gangs and commit them atrocities one more time? Why don't you have a drink of alcohol and do that? No. See, alcoholics of my type, and that's what Alcoholics Anonymous is all about, it's what our book is written about. Alcoholics of my type do not take a drink of alcohol after being sober for a period of time to get drunk. We don't take a drink to go out and have a party. <laughs> we take a drink of alcohol after being sober for a period of time just to go. Whew. But see, if you're an alcoholic of my type, that's all it takes. Because then you're straddled with the phenomenon of craving. And if you don't understand the phenomenon of craving, You've got no business being in an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting claiming to be an alcoholic because that's what it's all about. I didn't know that. I didn't have the slightest idea. On a street corner, I'm a furlough from a reform school. I don't know, 10 or 11 years old. I'm drinking a bottle of Marco Petri red wine. Now, most of you have never heard of Marco Petri red wine. And the reason you never heard about it is because it was the experimental stage of the Thunderbird. That's why you never heard of it. I'll tell you how bad it was. It never saw a grape. It, 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 it. You see, I'm really kind of a unique individual, if you want to know the truth. I started on cheap wine work down. And that ain't easy. Here I'm sitting around my little gang, and we're hippity-hopping out there and playing gang bangers before it was popular. Try to act bad and talk bad and smell bad and talk, tell me how bad we were. Scared to death that somebody's going to find out we weren't bad. I'm drinking this cheap wine and somebody said, try these. He gave me some pills. Now, I don't remember saying to him, what are those? (laughs) Will they bother me if I take them? (laughs) I just (laughs) took them. Thank God they weren't x lax could you imagine what could be going on in these discussion meetings? <laughs> Use your imagination. It works, all I can tell you. It's just like it, was like, it was like lighting the afterburners on a rocket ship. Well, my rocket ship never took me up here. 
my rocket ship took me straight to hell. If your hell is any hotter than where I've been, I pray God I don't ever go there. Because a couple of years later, I'm sitting on that same street corner. I'm on a furlough from another reform school. And I'm eating these pellets and I'm drinking this cheap wine. And a guy stuck a needle in my arm. And for the next 14 years of my life, I stuck needles in my arm and out of institutions. That's what I do. See, I live out in the streets. And I do what people like me who live in the streets do. I destroy everything that comes in contact with me. There's a reason for that. I'm a taker. I'm a taker of things and I'm a user of people, so therefore I'm a loser. I'm selfish. I'm self-centered. I'm self-serving. I got an ego bigger than this whole building. My entire lifetime was spent all my life. Before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous for a long time after I was here, without a conscious thought or a conscious concern for any other human being who lives upon the face of this earth, I'm not interested in you at all, unless you've got something I want. Then when I get whatever it is that you've got that I want, I cast you aside like so much trash and I go on about my business. That's the way I live my life. Oh, I didn't live my life like that one day or one week or one month or till the heat got on. I lived my life like that from my earliest recollection of life until a long time after I was an alcoholic now. And at the ripe old age of 25 or 26 years old, I came to in a cell in solitary confinement in a maximum security penitentiary reducing it out of total insanity. And what's significant about that to me today because I've had a glorious couple of days in the Oregon area. That day when I came to, there wasn't a single solitary soul left upon the face of this earth that would send me a penny postcard. They were all gone. But you know what? They should be gone. I don't have any right to have any of them back or anything good and decent in my life just because I got sober. Everything that's good and decent in my life is some type of an unearned gift that I have received from this God I discovered sitting in meetings of alcoholics not. I'm not entitled to any of it. I'm glad I got it. That's what stumbled into your meetings of alcoholics not. November the 4th, 1959. If I'd have known why I was coming that day, it wouldn't have come. <laughs> I wasn't alcoholic. I was sitting in the yard and I watched, saw some women walk across the yard and I got up and followed them. <laughs> I came to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous almost 48 years ago to smell perfume. <laughs> I've been honking and sniffing around her ever since. <laughs> that may have been the motivation that got me or the attraction that brought me to Alcoholics Anonymous, but that's not what got me to Alcoholics Anonymous. I've had a long time looking back on it with sober eyes. See, my last time out, for all intents and purposes, I killed me. I had two years doing to me anything I wanted to do to me, any time I wanted to do it to me was as much money as I needed to do it with. And I ended up strapped down in a bed in the old Los Angeles County Jail, a bright yellow, 128 pounds, with a doctor standing at the foot of my bed telling me I'm going to die. That is the most classic example of self-will run riot that I've ever heard of. You know, that didn't seem like a bad idea to me then. See, I didn't want to go on living the way I'd been living. And I didn't know any escape from it. I was going to live doomed this way for the rest of my life, and I knew it. Death seemed like a good idea. But a funny thing happened. I laid in that bed all day and all night, and he came back in there the next morning and said the same thing to me. A period of time went by, a few days, I don't remember. But one night I'm laying in that bed, and the idea came to me, and I was going to live and not die. I'm going to get up off that bed. I'm going to go to that penitentiary. I'm going to come back out and start that rat race all over again, and God knows I didn't want to do that. One day in the middle of the night, because I knew nothing better to do, I screamed out the only prayer ever said in my life. I said, oh, God, help me. I didn't think anything happened because there was no blinding flashes of light. Nobody come running down the hall with a dozen donuts saying, we got an A down there. 
I didn't get up and wander off into the tulip somewhere. I just went to sleep for a little while. And I started to get better and better. Two weeks later, I'm up running around the jail looking for some more of the poison putting me back on the bed I'd just gotten off of. Now, there's a real good reason for that. In the back of my mind tonight, just like it was that day in the old Los Angeles County Jail, I know what makes the big hurt go away. I'm alcoholic. If you put me in the wrong place at the wrong time in the wrong set of circumstances, I'm going to be drunk. I don't have any more choice about that than I do about flying around this room. None whatsoever. Because I can't live in a spiritless world without a spiritual answer for my spiritual illness. And my spiritual answer before I got out of Kanamba was an alcohol thing called spirit. Do you know that whiskey is a spirit? That's why alcoholics get relief from their spiritual malady. They put a spirit inside of them. And when you take the spirit away from a guy like me, the restlessness and the irritability and the discontentment come. And I need an answer for that malady. I didn't know that. I didn't know it at all. My grandmother who adored me. I was a bright shining light in my grandmother's eyes when I was little. The last time I saw my grandmother, my grandmother was kneeling at my bed in manager's clinic in Topeka, Kansas. And I'm tied down there for a series of electroshock treatments. And my grandmother's crying and praying for me. I'm not going to stand here and tell you that I don't think my grandmother's prayers kept me out of harm's way from time to time. I'm sure it helps. But I can tell you something I know without a shadow of a doubt. It wasn't until I asked God for help that I could possibly ever get it. I had to ask it. And one of the great lines in our book, Alcoholics Anonymous, is this. Deep down inside of every man, woman, and child is the basic fundamental idea of God. That's it. But I wandered into this room. I sit down in the back row where people like me sit. I don't want to be up too close. Somebody might think I'm a member of AA, whatever it is. I call that my throne of contempt. I had my coat collar up and my shades on because I was cool. If I'd have been any cooler when I got here, I'd have froze to death, for God's sake. <laughs> I look up on the backboard, I saw two big gates, and I thought to myself, my God, I've wandered into an anti-aircraft brigade. I said to this clown said next to me, what's this? He said, it's Alcoholics Anonymous. I sunk down in my seat. I didn't want anybody to see the big gangster hanging out with them wine hooks. Then Gangsters Anonymous, or... Overhip Anonymous, or Doo Doo's Anonymous, or Dolphins Anonymous. Woo-hoo. Dolphin. Oh, you can get your hair up on that one, huh? Dolphin. Makes addicts seem kind of candy ass, don't it? <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me, so how in the hell can I seek some type of an answer? I thought, well, I'll wait for these women to get up and tell Racy's stories. Now you got to remember that when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, there weren't very many young, pretty girls hanging around Alcoholics Anonymous. If they were, they weren't sending up that penitentiary where I was at, I'll tell you that. These old gals got up to talk, and one of them said she drank for a long time. Hell, you could look at her and know she'd been somewhere for a long time. She said, I used to drink. I said, I'll bet you did. Bad stuff, too. See, I knew everything when I got here. I'm a walking encyclopedia of useless information. I know so much that I've almost did. I'm just waiting for somebody to lay down and die. I didn't know what was going on. Something about these people that fascinated me. I couldn't understand what it was. I know what it is today. It's one alcoholic is attracted to another alcoholic. I didn't know that. I couldn't figure out what they were doing. You know what they did? They got up on Sunday morning 
They left their families. They left their TV sets and their football games. They got in their car. They drove 100 miles up those old back roads. They bought their own gasoline. They bought their own food. There was no money in the treatment of alcoholism in those days. Everybody did it the way it's supposed to be done, for free and for fun. It was an amazing thing. They came up there and spent two hours talking to a room full of people who didn't want to listen to them. People like me who were sitting in the back row and made fun of them. Let me tell you how very sick that is. It took me a long time to figure this out because I'm a quick study. <laughs> Here I am sitting in the penitentiary. I don't know when I'm going home. And I'm making fun of people who are leaving in an hour. <laughs> oh, but I'm hip. Bounce around. If I'd had a hat, I'd have had it on backwards. I don't understand these people. You know why I don't understand them? Because I'm a taker. Takers don't understand givers. You know why? Because takers don't hang out with givers. Takers just hang out with takers. That's why they're all losers. You just have to keep finding another group of suckers to take from. That's all. And there I sit. They fascinated me. I sit in their meetings of alcoholics and I. People would get up the podium like this and say, I used to drink. Now I don't drink anymore. Everything is just wonderful. <laughs> Back there where I'm sitting in inventory point. <laughs> I'm saying to myself, I guess I'm not alcoholic then. I'm not drinking either. I'm as sober as you are, Buster, and I'm crazy. God, how I wish I was alcoholic. If I was alcoholic, then all I'm going to have to do is not drink and I'd be okay. You see what I'm trying to do in my mind, and because I don't know anything better, I'm trying to identify a spiritual illness with a liquid called alcohol. I'm trying to identify my illness with alcohol, which is the answer to my problem. I didn't understand that. My problem is I'm spiritually ill and I'm restless and I'm irritable and I'm discontented when that spirit is not at rest and if I don't drink I'm going to blow my brains out I don't understand that so I sit in these meetings wishing I was alcoholic God if I could just be alcoholic then all I'd have to do is not drink and I'd be okay but I'm not alcoholic because I'm not drinking and I'm crazy I'm not drinking and I'm not sleeping at night. When I'm sober, I wake up in the middle of the night with cold sweat with the nightmares. I see my mother sitting at a gravesite while I'm handcuffed between two detectives. And I'm watching them bury my baby brother. I'm waking up in the middle of the night with thousands and countless faces of people with terror, looks of terror in their eyes that I'm about ready to do something to them. That's what sobriety is to me. No wonder when I'm face to face with my, the reality of my life. No wonder my brain checks out from time to time because I can't stand me. And I don't know what to do about it because I have no relief. So I sit in her meetings, not being a part of them, not being a part of anything, wishing I could be. And one day, I, a thing happened. A man wandered into that institution that I knew did 23 flat years in the penitentiary. He stood at the podium of Alcoholics Anonymous and told me something I've never forgotten. Makes more sense to me than anything that I've ever heard. It makes more sense to me right now than anything that I know. It'll make more sense to me tomorrow than anything I could possibly ever learn. He looked down where I was sitting and he said, you don't have to live like this no more if you don't want to. You don't have to do it like this no more. Nobody had ever told me that. They had been telling me since I was nine years old that I shouldn't drink these things and swallow these things, smoke these things, and shoot these things. But they never told me how to live without doing it. They just said, don't do it. 
and what none of those great learned people ever learned is that every time they told me that I was as physically sober as I am right now. How many times did I want to scream out at them across the desk, Good God, doctor, don't you understand? Because they don't. If you're not alcoholic, you'll never understand why I drink. But if you're not alcoholic, I'll never understand why you don't. Have you ever listened to them? I mean, they're pathetic. They say things like, oh, no thanks, I'm starting to feel it. My favorite of all favorites is, oh, I just got paid, I got to go home. You give me two drinks, we're going to Mexico. So I don't understand what's going on here. I walked up to this man that day, and for the first time in my life, I think, I asked a question that was going to save my life. I said to him, how do you learn how to live? He gave me a very simple answer that's almost being lost in Alcoholics Anonymous with all the influx and all the psychobabble that's been introduced into our fellowship. He told me there was a book called Alcoholics Anonymous in the library. If I'd go get that book, he'd go home and pray that I'd find some part of me in it. So the next day, I went over to the prison library and stole the book. <laughs> well, you got to remember, i got a big-time gangster image hanging around the penitentiaries. I don't want anybody to see me checking out a lame thing called Alcoholics Anonymous. How lame is that? I mean, when you're hip, you're hip. Get it on, you know what I mean? And I snuck it into my cell, and when nobody was around, I started to read it. Now, I didn't open up the book Alcoholics Anonymous with any great ideas about getting sober and staying sober and living this good life that I have. Not at all. I, I opened it up with the loser's theme song going on in my head. I'm going to read this book and prove to you my case is different, that it won't work for me. It's a loser's theme song. You don't understand. My case is different. <laughs> yep. You keep thinking that. You keep hanging on to your little differences with your andes and separations and all that other crap. You don't have to worry about it. You won't be an alcoholic and on very much longer anyhow. And don't be, don't be worrying about these old timers who seem a little gruff and hard on you sometime because you'll never be one. I don't judge. I just report to you the facts. <laughs> so I started to read this book, Alcoholics Not. And a strange thing happened to me. I was reading into the doctor's opinion. And something caught my attention. It was a thing that caused a phenomenon of craving. Well, the good doctor said that men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. And even though they know that it's injurious, after a while they cannot differentiate the true from the false, and they think their alcoholic life is normal. Unless they can experience the peace and that comes at once by taking a few drinks. Now, it doesn't say at once by sniffing something or swallowing something or snorting something or shooting something. This is at once by taking a few drinks. And then they develop the phenomenal craving. You know, I have been given so many opportunities before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, before I was 20 years old, that it absolutely blows my mind. I was given the body of an athlete. I was given an arm that could throw a baseball through a wall. I was given eyes that could hit a BB. I could run like a deer. And while I'm in a boy's home in the San Fernando Valley, I was offered a scholarship to the University of California, Los Angeles, to play baseball. I love to play baseball. All I've ever wanted to do in my entire life was to play baseball. As far back as I'd ever possibly I wanted to play baseball. I ate it. I slept it, I dreamed about it, I played baseball. Only when I was locked up, I played baseball. I never got to the University of California, Los Angeles. 
when I was at San Quentin State Penitentiary, I was offered an opportunity to go to St. Petersburg, Florida and play baseball for the St. Louis Cardinals. I never got to St. Petersburg, Florida. I thought all my life prior to reading that sentence in that book is because I came out of them drunken people. Came out of them ghettos, out of them gangs, out of them penitentiaries. I thought it was never my fault. I made victimization popular before anybody ever knew anything about it, for Christ's sake. <laughs> for the first time in my entire life, I recognized that the reason I didn't go to UCLA and the reason I didn't play baseball for the St. Louis Cardinals is because I took a drink of alcohol. For the first time in my entire life, it was my fault. It wasn't anybody else's fault. That's the beginning of the beginning of the beginning of my entrance into Alcoholics Anonymous. I started to assume the responsibilities for my own actions prior to coming to Alcoholics Anonymous. I could blame nothing or nothing or no one up to that particular point. I couldn't even blame alcohol. It was me. And I read into the book, I read about Doc Bill Wilson, the co-founder of our book, Alcoholics Now. I didn't identify with Bill Wilson. I don't know anything about New York stockbrokers. I'm a street kid. I know how to maneuver and steal things and hurt people and do stuff like that. I didn't identify with what he did for a living. I, de I identified what he did or how he felt when he was sober. How he would wake up with the four horsemen of terror, bewilderment, loneliness, and fear. My constant companions when I was sober. The thing that drove me crazy. And I went on into our book, Alcoholics Anonymous. I found myself sitting in a room with a man one day doing what our program of recovery says is a fifth step. I heard myself say to that man that day that I was an alcoholic. From way down here where I live, there came a freedom that I carry with me to this very instant. As I stand here before you tonight, it's something I've known for the last almost 47 years of my life. I know exactly what's wrong with me. I'm an alcoholic, and I suffer from an illness called alcoholism. I am not an alcoholic and anything. When I was an alcoholic and something or other, I couldn't have your program. And the reason I couldn't have it is I separated me from you. I'm a little better than you. I'm a little slicker than you. I'm a little hipper than you. I'm a little smarter. I'm a little richer. I'm a little poorer. I'm not like you. When I became just like you, or at least like the people who wrote our book, it became my great privilege to be allowed to practice the only program of recovery for alcoholics of my type in 5,000 years of recorded history. What really blows my mind is that I can do it. That's what blows my mind. I get to live this magnificent program of recovery. I get to go to meetings of alcoholics not. I get to make coffee in meetings of Alcoholics Not. I get to set up the chairs and I take them down. I get to go to institutions that I came out of. I get to take people through the steps. I get to go through the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous again. I get to do a lot of things in Alcoholics Anonymous. Isn't that amazing? I don't have to do any of those things. I get to. There's a tremendous difference between have to and get to. It's a joy to practice this program of recovery called Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a, the most miraculous thing that I know of. When I, I walked out to some lady got up here tonight and said her sobriety date was June the 4th, something or other. I walked out of the penitentiary on June the 4th, 1961. Now, I don't know nothing about that world out there. I've never had a job. I never had a Social Security card. I didn't have a driver's license. I didn't have anything. I had $25 on a please don't rain on me suit. That's it. 
I, when I was armed with something that I had never been armed with all the years that I've been walking in and out of institution. Somewhere along the line in the last year and a half I was in that institution, I had incorporated the first nine steps of our program of recovery in my life. And so when it came time to walk out of the penitentiary, all I did was just change meeting places. Amazing. I went home to see my mother. She fell off the steps blind drunk. I picked her up and put her on the couch said, Mom, I'm going to an AA meeting. She said, fine, I think you should. <laughs> I like to tell you I got sober and my mom got sober and my dog got sober and my cat got sober and we're the sober, sober, sober. That's not my experience. See, I can't speak to you beyond my experience. My mother drank herself to death here. And I had a ringside seat watching her. Safe in the confines and the comfort of Alcoholics Anonymous, I watched my mother drink herself to death. Powerless to do anything about it whatsoever. My mother would come to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous because she could not drink anymore. And she'd sit in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous until she could no longer sit here anymore. The tale of alcoholics beyond description in Alcoholics Anonymous. I guess if I told that to some of you graduates from our other place, you'd probably say, I guess your mama was in a state of denial. <laughs> <laughs> there ain't no denial in my book, Alcoholics Anonymous. The denial is a river in Egypt. My illness is described this way in our book. It says, I have a delusion. A delusion. That somehow, someday, I'm going to control and enjoy my drinking. That's not a denial. You know what denial is? If you say you're in denial, you know what you are? You're just a liar. You know why I know you're a liar if you say you're in denial? Because every time I got arrested, I denied it. I didn't do that. No, I didn't. They come kicking my mother's door in one time and found some drugs there. Nobody living there but me and my mother. They said, who is this? I said, I don't know. <laughs> well, there ain't nobody here but you and your mother. I said, well, ain't mine. <laughs> now, that's a denial. I went to a meeting one night, and a guy walked up to me and said, you're going to be my sponsor. His name is Norm Alpe. He's been dead now for a long time. Best member of AA I've ever known in my life, anywhere. Before, since, or hereafter. The best member of AA I've ever known. Walked right down the middle of the road, didn't budge one way or the other. He walked up to me, made a simple, I'm going to be your sponsor. I looked around, I gave him that little slick self-knowledge, idiosyncrasy that people like me have, and I said, What's that? Book don't talk about no sponsor, baby. You know how slick you can be when you got a little bit of knowledge in your head? All newcomers are dangerous, for Christ's sake. <laughs> Particularly if they know something or think they do. He says, well, I says, he says, well, I'm just going to help you get things done that need to be done, Johnny. I said, okay, what do you want me to do? Anyhow. He says, why do you ask me? I said, you just told me you were going to be my sponsor. He said, Johnny, if I can't run my life, what the hell makes you think I can run yours? I said, then what am I supposed to do? He says, why don't you do what I do? I said, just what is it you do? He says, if you do what I do, then you'll know what I do. <laughs> I just broke up the great mystery of sponsorship to you. Well, monkey see, monkey do. <laughs> but you just got to pick the right monkey. <laughs> you got a lot of wolves running around in monkey suits. They ain't monkeys. Oh, they tell you stuff like, oh, you don't have to do that in that meeting. Just go there and sit down and tell them tell you're alcoholic. <laughs> you have to do nothing. Don't put no money in the bank. Blah, 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 blah. You have to take no image. You have to take no steps. You have to do it. You do it fine. Just do what you want to do. <laughs> Don't drink your ass falls off. That's a good one. <laughs> Anybody told you that's not alcoholic? 
I'll be drunk a long time before my ass falls off. I don't like pain. He was the cruelest man I've ever known, my sponsor. You know what the first thing he said to me was? Why don't you get a job and go to work? You're a bum. I said, I'm not a bum. So what are you? He said, I'm an AA member. He said, no, you're a bum. You're an AA bum. Bums don't work, bum. He said, you better get off of welfare, too. And I almost hit him. I said, don't you ever say that to me, Norm Alpey. I'll hit you. He said, what do you call living in penitentiary? Self-supporting through your own contribution? <laughs> I got a job working in the oil field. Now, that's not much of a job for a big high rolling dope dealing pimp, is it? <laughs> Somebody stole my first paycheck. Now, if you want to hear somebody scream, you ought to hear a thief when they get stolen from. I ranted and raved and jumped and hollered. If you caught that, caught that guy, I'd be, I wouldn't be here tonight. I'd be up in Folsom somewhere telling you, hey, it don't work. That's what them losers tell you. You know, hey, it don't work. <laughs> How the hell would they know? I went back to work that day. I'm going ever since. Isn't that amazing? No, no, nobody, nothing. All my bills are paid. I live in a nice little house with a woman I love. Got a nice little dog. Little dog about that big. About that high. Weighs 10 pounds. Little gray, got purple ribbons in her hair. <laughs> got a little purple leash. I take her to Petco, let her pick out her toys. <laughs> All the time I'm walking around Petco with her, I'm singing to myself, if they could see me now, that old gang. <laughs> you wouldn't believe it. But Norm told me I couldn't drive a car because I didn't have a driver's license. I said, what's that got to do with anything? I prayed most of my life that they would arrest me for not driving a driver's license so I could get 30 days of rest in the county jail. He said, well, Johnny, said it may not have anything to do with it. If you drive, you may get drunk. So I'd have to call him up for rides to meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Norm, Norm, what do you want, jackass? <laughs> Norm, I know you're going by here tonight to go to a meeting. I'll call it Thomas. Would you mind coming by and pick me up? I'd really like to go to a meeting with you tonight, Norm. I know you're speaking over there in Santa Ana. Would you come? You know, he's, he's just brown nose and up the yawaha. You know what I mean? He's okay. I'll be by there at six o'clock, jackass. Stand on the street corner. I ain't waiting for you. <laughs> Jesus. I was thinking about it one night. It's hot July night. I'm going over this little club over in Orange County and little one-car garage. Everybody smokes. They're all evil in those days. You couldn't even see the speaker sitting where Ann's sitting. Yet. <laughs> so I started to think. Now, if you're new, Alcoholics Anonymous, do one of two things. Drink or think. But don't think. Think, think, think. Somebody ought to destroy that sign in the Milano Club. I'm going to think if we're going to this place over there, it's hot, and I'm uncomfortable, and so I'm going to get comfortable. So I put on my new tank top and my new shorts, put my feet in my thong, slick my hair back, put my shades on, and stood on the street corner, waited for my sponsor. My sponsor drove up, took one look at me, and drove off. <laughs> Along about 11 o'clock that night, the phone rang at his house. Norm, what do you want, jackass? Some of us have to work tomorrow. Always said stuff like that. So you left me standing on the street corner like an idiot. He says, you are an idiot. He says, you act like an idiot. You behave like an idiot. You even dress like an idiot. So you left me standing on the street corner. He said, yeah. 
I said, why? He says, you really want to know? And I said, yeah. He said, I'm going to ask you a question. He said, would you go to church dressed like that, Johnny? I said, no. He says, you're not going to my church dressed like that either. I says, while we're on this subject, let's get a few things straight here. I said, you yell at me in meetings and tell me to shut up and sit still. You won't let me get up and move around when there's new girls around. <laughs> he said, that's right. I said, why? He said, Johnny, if you want to go to meetings and you don't want to listen, that's your business. Have you ever stopped to think that maybe somebody else does? I said, no, I haven't. <laughs> he said, I didn't think so. Selfish, self-centered people like you don't ever think about anybody but yourself. So maybe sometime you ought to go sit in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, look like you're on some type of road of recovery, try to dress a little bit better than a newcomer, and keep your damn mouth shut. Ooh. <laughs> and I said, why? <laughs> he says, one of these days, Johnny, one of these days, you're going to need to hear everything you've ever heard in a meeting called it's not. The time is going to come when you're going to need that phrase. I said, what is it? He said, I don't know what your phrase is. That's why you better sit still and pay attention. That's why you better go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous where people have enough respect and love for Alcoholics Anonymous to set some type of an example for the new people who come there who dress like they're being recovered in Alcoholics Anonymous, who sit still and pay attention and listen to what's going on, even though they're upset and miserable and something terrible going on in their life. They have enough love and respect for the people around them. They have a little simple thing that they never learned before to come to Alcoholics Anonymous if they're alcoholic. They don't have any common idea about common courtesy. Jesus, I didn't ask all these questions. <laughs> But that's the information I'm getting. And it's come past. Those are the only type of meetings I go to. I go to meetings where people love alcoholics none. Where people are trying to present some type of an example for the newcomer. To give this newcomer something to shoot for. To show the newcomer that they're just not just changing places. That they don't have to go back into the gang that they just left. They don't have to hang around the people they've just been hanging around with. That they have people who are trying to live by some type of spiritual principles who are interested in the love and the continuation and the things of Alcoholics Anonymous. What a magnificent thing that man taught me. Those are the meetings I go to today. I go to meetings where everybody sits down and sits still. When they hit the gavel, everybody sits down and shuts up. And there's nothing said in that meeting from the audience until they start saying the Lord's Prayer. So everybody that goes in that meeting has an opportunity to hear the small, quiet voice of God, wherever it may come from. The reason I still go to five or six meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous is very simple. I love meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous reason I still go back to the penitentiaries that I come out of is because I want to show people they don't have to live that way anymore. I don't go back into penitentiaries wearing Levi's and jeans and shorts and tank tops. I walk back into penitentiaries wearing the best suit I own. Not because I'm trying to own up somebody, but I'm sitting there trying to show people that you can look decent and behave decent and care about other people and alcoholics and not. That's what AA is all about anyhow. AA is all about living some other life an example for other people. There's good examples, bad examples in here. That's all. All you got to do is ask yourself, am I a good example? Am I trying to show the newcomer something they can live for, something for them to shoot? It doesn't take much of an effort. But it takes a little bit of concern. That's what my sponsor taught me. Taught me all that. Taught me to love you. That's all. 
It's just something that's come to pass. I love people. I love the newcomers in Alcoholics now. I'll tell you a little story. I, I love this little story. It's really true. Every year for years, I used to go up to a meeting in San Jose and talk for a guy I sponsored. He's dead now. And I went up there one night, and I pretty much dressed like this. I'm always dressed like this when I'm going to participate in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I walk in there, and I walk in, and I, I don't know, get a cup of coffee, and I sit down in a chair. And some kid come bouncing up there. You know, he was hip. He, 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 he. I mean, he, you know, he had so much jewelry sticking out of him, I nicknamed him Pierce. And he said, hey, man. I said, yeah. And he said, you Johnny Harris? And I said, yeah. You, know, you don't look like him. <laughs> I said, what, well, what does he look like? Yeah, I don't know, man. They've been paying your tape for us over there in the home, man. You know, you did all that. Doo, 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 blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, well, if I had a leather jacket on and earrings hanging out of my ear, chains hanging around my neck, wearing jeans and talking out of the corner of my mouth and using mother every other word, would it kind of fit your image? He said, yeah, man. I said, you don't understand, man. I live by a program that's spiritual in nature. When practice is a way of life, evolves you out of that garbage. He looked at me and he said, the hell you say, and turned one off top. I thought, well, I've made another friend. <laughs> About three or four months later, I'm speaking at a meeting in Reno, Nevada. It's Saturday night in a room about this size, and I walk in. I walk down the side of the coffee table and turn around, walk over there, and they're sitting in the front row where Dave and Hannah are sitting. It's this kid. Well, it ain't that same kid no more. He got a pair of slacks on and a collared shirt. He got rid of his jewelry. Got his hair cut. He stood up and said, I walked over to him, and he looked at me, and he said, uh, he said, I didn't hardly recognize you. He said, well, I just want to let you know something. I said, what's that? He said, I'm trying to live by the same spiritual program that you are. I think back two or three months how I could have killed him in San Jose. Easily. I just could have, I just could have given him a death sentence in San Jose. You know how I could have done it? I could have got down with him. You know what I mean? I could have become Johnny. <laughs> the badass convict dude. How come ain't none of them suckers ever say, let's go get up? <laughs> All they ever tell you is, hey, baby, let's go get down. You know why they don't tell you, let's go get up? Because ain't none of them tramps that down want you up. Because if you're up and they're down, you're testimony to the lie they're living. That's what my sponsor taught me. I'll be forever grateful for that man, for that, and for me not to uphold the teaching that he gave me and to want to pass it on to the people that I sponsor. I might have just well go out and urinate on his grave. Because I feel I've been given a great legacy. I know what's happened to me. I know it better than anybody what's happened to me. The good, the bad, and the ugly. I know what's happened to me. I know the actions that I have taken to bring my life about to what it is today. I know the great success story of my life as it is. That's the only experience, the only true story about what Alcoholics Anonymous can do for an individual I know about myself. And so what has happened is I love the people that I sponsor. I love the people that God has placed in my care to help them along this happy road of destiny. I love them. I want them to have exactly the same opportunity and the same thing and experience the great freedom and the great love for Alcoholics Anonymous that I have experienced. I want them to live in a home with a woman that they love and adore and respect. I want to be able to go to work and do a good day's pay, work for a good day's pay. I want to be able to 
go out and make calls on people and go where they're asked to go and do what they're supposed to be doing. I want to enjoy all the magnificent wonders of Alcoholics Anonymous because that's what happened to me. That's why I can tell you I love the people I sponsor. That's why I love the people that I work with. If you're new here in Alcoholics Anonymous and you have somebody that isn't interested in you doing these kind of things, my advice to you is you better stay away from them because they really don't care for you. Because if they say they've got something out of Alcoholics Anonymous when they were new and they're not doing it anymore, they're just liars or they don't care for you at all. I do. I want you to have all the goodness and the blessing within my life. So that's why I tell you about Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know anything about anything else. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous give me so much it's hard for me to understand. It's amazing. The payoff in Alcoholics Anonymous today should not be being sober. Not at all. The payoff in Alcoholics Anonymous is watching the light come on in your eyes. The only way that I can recognize the light coming on in your eyes is had to come on inside of me. The only way I can recognize the changes in you because there had to be some changes in me. That's what AA is all about. For you who are new, I'm going to tell you this. If you're here to get anything in Alcoholics Anonymous, there's nothing here to give. There's nothing to get in Alcoholics Anonymous. If you're here to get anything, whatever it is in your sick little head you think you're here to get, whether it's a court card being signed, or it's to get sober, or to get a 30-day chip, or a 60-day chip, or a five-year chip. If you're only here to get those kind of things, you're here for the wrong reason. Alcoholics Anonymous has nothing for you to get. It just has an opportunity for you to serve. That's what it's all about. Every living thing in my life I owe to Alcoholics Anonymous. Everything. Everything I may ever hope to have in my life, I will owe to Alcoholics Anonymous. And dear friends, you better believe this. It is a long, long walk from a cell in solitary confinement at a maximum security penitentiary to where I stand right now. But for the great God, AA and good people like you, I could have missed it all. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.